Sex. Throughout the Bible, it's proclaimed as a good thing, a profound expression of love that forges a unique and powerful bond between a man and a woman. But along the way, something went seriously wrong. When humanity left their perfect and life-giving relationship with God, sin entered the scene and infected everything. Sin caused people to become disconnected from God, from each other, and from themselves. Sex, the ultimate connection between men and women, couldn't hide for long. Sin grabbed hold of sex and transformed it into something completely unrecognizable. This new form of sex had nothing to do with respect or commitment and everything to do with lust and control. It was no longer about two people becoming one. Sex became about the desires of the individual, a way for people to get what they want from one another. To put it plainly, sex became a transaction. And so, sex strayed further and further away from God's original plan. Fast forward to today, and sex is everywhere. People are obsessed with it. Sex, which used to be a good thing, became an ultimate thing. Something that validates one's very existence and a reason for living. And with its new and elevated status came many promises. Promises it couldn't deliver, leaving an entire society feeling empty and disillusioned. But like any addiction, the answer is always more. More relationships, more romance, and of course, more sex. And it's in this endless search that we find ourselves. Sex is clearly broken, but it isn't the real problem. It's simply the crack on the surface. The real problem of sin goes much deeper, and its consequences are far more devastating. Here's the good news, though. There's still hope. God can redeem you and your sexuality. Sex can be a good thing again. Well, welcome. I'm so glad everybody's here. Uh, you know, it's always interesting to me that we're doing a sex topic that anybody comes. It's a little awkward at times, isn't it? Um, but, you know, uh, we, we need to talk about this. It's, we are created as sexual beings, and we need to know why God created us that way and how we handle this, and especially how do we live in the goodness that he has for us. How many of you remember getting the sex talk when you were younger? Anybody? Yeah? So I, I remember it, and I, I just want you to know that this is not that, okay? If you thought I was going to give you the sex talk today, I, I'm not here. If you're just trusting me to do that for your kids, that's not what this is all about. Uh, I'll never forget when I got the sex talk, uh, my dad, this is all he did, and, and maybe some of you had this as well. I don't want this talk to be this for you. It was just so awkward, didn't want to look in his eyes. I was so glad when it was over. But all dad said to me was, uh, Jeffrey, that's what he calls me, and it's Jeff, but he calls me Jeffrey. He said, whatever you do, don't get her pregnant. I'm like, that's it? I was a sophomore in college at that point. <laughs> I'm like, dad, you don't understand. I, I said, I learned everything that you want to tell me already from my sixth and seventh grade buddies when I was back there. <laughs> and unfortunately, a lot of us, that's where we learn about it, and we never progress. And there were so many things that, that I didn't know, so many things that they didn't tell me, especially when it came to uh, what God did for us in creating us as sexual beings. Now, I, I want you to know that my goal throughout this series is to point you toward God's blessing in your life for this, uh, because we are sexual beings, and he has a plan for your life. You need to know that. If you're here uh, for the first time, you're just exploring the potential of having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you need to know he has a plan for your life. And it includes emotional, spiritual, and physical. And he says this in John 10.10. 10, Jesus said, I came to give you a rich, satisfying life. So even that we would experience that even more so in our physical life, God has that for us. Now, as we go through this, uh, we're going to have a lot of resources for you because I know this lands in so many different places. For some of you, uh, that's why we had the title, Unashamed. You'd say, man, I'm ashamed of my past, or maybe you feel like you're struggling to get through things. So we have some counselors lined up that are going to be a part of the talks over the next few weeks. Um, and uh, we also have a relationship seminar after this series. We have groups that are focusing on relationships. I got some books. You got a resource packet there that I'm recommending. Uh, one is Pulling Back the Shades. Uh, it's kind of a counter uh, answer to Shades of Grey that came out. Powerful book. Ladies, you will love this. It's written for the women. But I want to tell you, I've read through it. And guys, if you have a lady in your life, whether you're dating or married, you need to read this book. 
This will help you understand her so much more and her incredible uh, need and desire. Uh, couples, I have a book called Sheet Music that I recommend by Dr. Kevin Lehman right here in our town. A powerful play on words. I love that sheet music, kind of like Adam and the hot grill. Uh, you know, it's pretty bad, isn't it? Last night he said, this is the only hot grill you can take home with you guys. And I'm like, oh my gosh. It's, uh. And then Every Man's Battle. Uh, men, this is a powerful book for you. Um, good one to read. And, and again, women, if you feel like, man, my, my husband's just this sex craves guy. I don't understand it. You need to read this book so you can understand them more. Uh, so we want to really help out in, in walking through that. Now, we got this series from Genesis chapter 25 when God creates sex. He is the creator of sex. He creates it, and he says it's a good thing. By the way, everybody say good. good. Yeah, it, it's not a bad thing. It's not a dirty thing. It's a good thing. Now, the man and his wife were both naked. Read it with me, Church Online Join. But they felt no shame. That's where we got the title, Unashamed. They felt no shame. Well, why does shame enter the picture? You kind of see it in our introduction video here. That's not God's intent. In fact, there are some of you, you'd say, I'm a Christian and I'm trying to live God's way and I still feel shame. That's not God's intent. Some of you may have shame from uh, your pastor. You may say, Jeff, this is just a Christian talk and I really have a lot of pushback about Christian standards because, you know, really this is what culture says and I'm living in the current culture and I get that. Here's what I'm going to ask you just for the next few minutes, next 25 minutes, would you just open up your hearts and minds and say, okay, I'm willing to listen to what God says about the one who created sex, what he has to say about sex and my sexuality. Will you do that for 25 minutes? 35 minutes? No, okay, we'll stick with 20. How about 20? Everybody with 20? Just give me 20 minutes. And then after that, you know, if you say, well, Jeff, you didn't convince me, you know, uh, that's between you and God. And the one thing you need to know as we go throughout the series, uh, my goal is to get you to a place where you just say, I understand what God has, and I want to live in the fullness and richness of that in this area of my life, but you will not hear me being judgmental about you over the next few weeks. I, I'm not here to judge you. Uh, God, God is, the, is the God who's, who created this, and uh, we struggle to, in the same way, I mean, I struggled right along with you. I, I hope you won't judge me over the next few weeks. Will you do that? No judgment? Great. I'm not judging you, but about most of you are judging me. <laughs> okay, that's fair, but I, I want you to know that that's not what we're here for. I get, I get the pushback, but let's just be open and say, okay, what, what does this look like? What does God say about this? So today I want to talk about the benefit of sex. Now, I know if I were to say, hey, what do you think are the benefits of sex? We could list a bunch. I mean, top of the list for me, I'd say pleasure, right? You guys are afraid. You're like, we're in church. Are we allowed to say yes to <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Yes, you can say yes to that. I, I hope if you don't, if you haven't experienced that, we got counselors to help you, okay? Um, I mean, you know, God created sex. It's one of the top of the list. It's pleasure between uh, a man and a woman. Uh, I, you know, a lot of people would say, well, it's procreation. I mean, Kathy and I have four kids. Man, we, they're such a blessing to us. I get that. But there's one more, and it's really so important. It's the most important that we experience in our sex lives when it comes to our sexuality. And it's really the purpose behind what God designed sex for. And I want to talk to you about that benefit today. Now, before I jump into it, I want you guys to get involved in this series. So take out your phones. You can text me right now. Church Online, you can text online. I want you to answer this question. You can help write next week's talk. What question, what one question would you like Jeff, me, to address next weekend regarding sexual boundaries in the Bible? You see, I'm going to look at the why of sex today, and next week we're going to explore the boundaries and why boundaries. A lot of times we look at boundaries and we think, God just doesn't want us to have any fun. He just doesn't want us to enjoy life, and it's contrary to that. So we're going to look at boundaries and why. Why would God say that? I want to know the why, and when I go back to John 10.10 10 and God's purpose for my life, I have to realize, oh, he really does want me to have a rich and satisfying life. So what would those boundaries be that you want me to talk about? And by the way, something else big is happening next weekend. What is it? You guys know? Super Bowl. Super, man, not many football fans in here. Come on. The Broncos are playing. Okay, so I want you to know. I, I, the, the, Bronco, the Broncos are playing. Yeah. What are you guys? Who are you? Who are you? Oh, okay. Uh, so I'm a huge Bronco fan. I wanted you to know, I'll be watching the game next week, but I'll also be here in church. If you think, yeah, but I make a day of it, the good news is, if you didn't know it, we have a Saturday night service at 5 o'clock, okay? You can catch football. 
I mean, it doesn't get any better than this, you know, what, what kind of church you go to? There's food, talk about sex, and then I'm promoting football. Woo! <laughs> okay, I'll be watching the game, and, and, you know, I'm praying for the Broncos. We'll see how good my prayer life is, right? Um, so come, you know, make there, and there's a lot more room uh, Saturday night as well. I hope to see you then, and you guys be a part of writing this talk. Now, I want to deal with an overarching question today, or myth, and the myth is this. Sex is only physical. You see, the truth is, culture would tell us that, and on the surface, that's, that's kind of what we would like, just to think, this is physical. There's nothing more to it than that. that. That it really doesn't go any deeper than that, and that whatever I want to do, I can do, and it, it doesn't hurt anybody. I, I know this about us. There's something in us, intuitively, that we would say, that's not true. We like to think that. We want to think that, but we know that it's not. And just to really bring this to the forefront in all of our minds and hearts, I want to ask you a couple questions. For some of you, they're very painful questions, maybe a little awkward, but I want to ask these questions just to help you see this and understand. Why is it when a person is sexually assaulted, whether it's a, a woman, a man, or a child, why is it when they're sexually assaulted, it's more devastating than getting beat up? If somebody gets beat up physically and they heal up and it's like, well, let's shake it off and get on with life. If sex is just physical, if it is the myth is true, then why can't we tell a woman or a man who is sexually assaulted, say, hey, man, just get over it, shake it off, get on with life. But there's something inside of us we go, oh, no, it's so much more than that. If it's just physical, why can't we just tell a kid who's been sexually assaulted and say, hey, you know, when you grow up and you start connecting the dots and you really understand this, don't let it affect the rest of your life. Just deal with it and go on. Shake it off. And even as I say that, some of us go, oh, man, that's, I can't believe you'd even say those words. And the reason we have that feeling and the reason it causes a tension in here, even as I say that, is because we know inside of us, we understand it's more than just physical. It's about our whole personhood. This involves all of our lives. The good news is God designed it that way with his plan in mind. Let me ask you another question. And I do want to say this. Even as I ask these questions for some of you, you say, man, I'm dealing with the pain of that, uh, having been assaulted. Or if you you would say, I'm the person who assaulted somebody and I'm dealing with the guilt of that. You need to know that God is a forgiving God. Aren't you glad for that? And you know that he's a healing God. You need to know that. And that's why we have counselors even throughout this whole series. We want to see God bring healing into your life. That's his desire as your loving Heavenly Father. He is not up in heaven going, ah, you guys deserve that. It's not what he's saying. He's going, oh, guys, you're missing the point of this whole thing. Second question. Why is it when a spouse, if sex is just physical, why is it when a spouse or a girlfriend or boyfriend, a lot of you are single here today, when they are dealing with a porn addiction or infidelity, why is it the other person can't just accept it and get over it? And some of you have been on both ends of this, or either end of this right now, you may be. And see, if the myth is true, what culture tells us that sex is just physical, why don't, why don't we just get over it and go on? Well, the reason is because we know that it's more than just physical. There's so much more to it than that. It's all of who we are. God has created us as sexual beings. Never forget that. I want to help illustrate this. Uh, you may know of a Stradivarius. You've maybe heard of the instrument. I'm a musician, so uh, Antonio Stradivarius in the seven, late 1700s, uh, early 1800s, he was a great violinist. This isn't what you think, guys. <laughs> I know, given the talk, some of the men, man, their eyes got really big when I whipped out the gloves. Like, what the heck is going on here? Yeah, pretty open church talking about sex, but woo. Um, so Stradivarius creates these instruments, and if you had one today, uh, depending on the shape, one of his violas uh, was on the market recently at an auction for $45 million. Just uh, in southern Italy, the, the, the wood that they use, the sound, nobody can, um, nobody can uh, copy that. So even if you have a violin uh, that is a very low end or in really bad shape, they're worth tens of thousands of dollars. If they're in any kind of shape at all, hundreds of thousands or a million dollars. Thank you so much, Jason. 
I'll have you wait there to take this back, okay? How many of you have played an instrument in your life? Yeah? Uh, ever held a Stradivarius, anybody? I had a, held a Stradivarius? Want to hold one? Wanna, anybody, who, who wants to hold one? Come on up. Yeah. Oh, you want to hold this? Yeah? Okay. Uh, be careful. We don't have any gloves for you. Yeah. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Uh, so thank you so much. And I, I owe you a meal for that or something. Girl, poor girl, she about had a heart attack. If that were a Stradivarius, I, I would not handle it that way, nor would you expect me to, right? I didn't tell you it was a Stradivarius, by the way. I just told you about Stradivarius and asked you if you wanted to hold my violin. So. Um, <laughs> Well, you wouldn't expect me to hold that way. And, and yet, you need to get this. A violin, I don't care if it's Stradivarius' very best violin, most expensive violin. It's just wood. It's just glue. It's just strings. It can be fixed and replaced. But when it comes to our lives, God created us as something so powerful. You're his masterpiece. And sometimes the way we handle ourselves, the way we handle other people when it comes to our sexuality we think, yeah, it, it can just be replaced. It can't. We get one time in this life, one shot. And right now, a whole bunch of you are going, well, if I've already messed up in the past, I'm feeling so much from it, what do I do? You need to know that God is a loving, healing, forgiving God. Anybody glad for that? Yeah. And he restores. And, and that's where I want to lead you to. Now, as we walk through this, I want you to see the truth. So the myth is, and you saw it in the questions, but the truth is sex is more than physical. You feel that, and even if you're still saying, I have a lot of pushback about that because I just want it to be physical for, my, for myself and for the way I live my life, you still feel that when you think about it with other people, with kids. Sex is more than physical. Let's say that together. Sex is more than, it's more than physical. And if it is more, then I need to understand that and know how to live in the incredible benefit that God has for sex. If you treat sex as just physical, you hurt yourself. Now, some of you about had a heart attack when I threw that violin when you were thinking it was a Stradivarius. But how much more when it comes to treat hurting yourself and realizing the incredible worth and value that God has placed on you? And, and I know there are a lot of you say, oh, God doesn't feel that way about me. My prayer is that day you would experience that. Whether you're a Christian or not, you are his greatest creation. He tells us that. You're his greatest creation. When you treat, if you treat sex as just physical, you hurt yourself and your future spouse. Single person, you need to know that today. And as we talk about this, there's a part of this. Man, dad never told me this part. I wish he had. I, I wish we could all have understood this. We need to get this because we're hurting not only ourselves, but our future person. We, someday you meet that person, you say, I want to spend my life with them. I love them. We need to know that sex is more than just physical. Truth. Sex is more than physical. Say it again. Sex is more than physical. What, what is it? Well, God created sex for intimacy. Say that word with me. Intimacy. Well, it's, it's created for intimacy. Now, let's, let's dissect this word for just a few moments because I, I get it. Male and female sees this word very different. Guys, you see it as sex. Ladies, and when I talk about intimacy, you're thinking, oh, romance, and you're just all caught up in that. So what is intimacy? Well, intimacy, according to Scripture and what God designed it for, is to know fully and to be fully known. That is to have somebody in your life that knows everything about you, that knows your secret, and still all your secrets, all your past, all your weaknesses, all your failures, all your strengths, and says, I love you. Man, I accept you. For, for ladies, this is that feeling that you have, this desire. And guys, you need to know that, that women, that they have this desire to say, this person gets me. That's that feeling of intimacy. He gets me. And guys, uh, for, for him, this is that feeling where, where he says, man, she's into me. You know, this intimacy that the two of you become so bound together that you are, as God says, one flesh. You see, the problem, if, if we think that sex is just physical, like culture tells us, we keep joining with another person and becoming one flesh over and over. And how many times can you do that and still enjoy the intimacy that God has for you? 
Because what God has made one, you don't unwind. That's what he has for us. God created sex for intimacy, to be known fully and to be fully known. Now, if you were invited by a friend today, I'm so glad you're here today, and I hope you enjoy the meal, and um, you're giving me 20 minutes or so just to talk with this, and you're open. I'm, you, you guys are a great crowd, but you had to know that if you're coming to a church and you're going to hear a pastor speak, I was going to talk about the Bible, right? Okay, so I'm going to talk about the Bible. Now, what I realize is I, I, I want to have some fun, too, with all this. Already, it was so fun. Throwing, I'm so sorry, Ken. I feel really bad. I wish I had a picture of your face, though. I'd still post it on the internet. I... <laughs> Yeah, I'd still do that. Uh, that was funny. Um, uh, uh, but I, I, I do want to have fun. You, you know, so I, I, it was a heavy, this was kind of a heavy introduction as we talk about and set up this series. Uh, so I'm going to lighten the mood a little bit. Are you guys okay with that? Yes. So I'm going to show you a video. It's one of my favorite videos when I talk about this subject. It's the Flight of the Concords, business time. You've got to watch this. We'll do another song. <laughs> We're gonna make love You know how I know, baby Cause it's Wednesday <laughs> And Wednesday night is the night that we make love Tuesday night's the night that we go and visit your mother But Wednesday night is the night that we make love Cause everything is just right Conditions are perfect There's nothing good on TV Conditions are perfect you're leaning close and say something sexy like I might go to bed, I've got work in the morning I know what you're trying to say, baby You're trying to say, oh yeah It's business time It's business time It's business It's business time That's what you're trying to say You're trying to say, let's get down to business It's business time Next thing you know, we're in the bathroom, brushing our teeth. That's all part of it, that's foreplay. <laughs> then you go sort out the recycling, that's not part of it, but it's still very important. <laughs> then, we're in the bedroom. You're wearing that ugly old baggy t-shirt from that team building exercise you did for your old work. <laughs> and it's never looked better on you. Exercise 99. Oh, you don't know what you're doing to me. I remove my jeans, but trip over them because I still got my shoes on. But then I turn it into a sexy dance. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm down to just my socks. And you know when I'm down to just my socks, what time it is. It's time for business. It's business time. business, that's why they call business socks. It's business, it's business time. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> making love, making love for two, making love for two minutes. <laughs> when it's with me, you only need two minutes, because I'm so intense. <laughs> two minutes in heaven is better than one minute in heaven. You say something like, is that it? I know what you're trying to say. You're trying to say, oh yeah, that's it. <laughs> then you tell me you want some more. Well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> but I'm quite sleepy. It's business, it's business time. Business hours are over.
Okay, ladies, if you ever want to know how a guy thinks about sex, that video, I mean, everything. She's brushing her teeth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, that, that's a lot of fun, isn't it? Let's see, what does the Bible say about getting down to business? I'm going to give you a couple things here, and then throughout the series, we're going to explore this more, telling you God created us this way to have a rich and satisfying life. Would you say this with me again? Sex is more than physical. It's more than physical. I want to take you to uh, 1 Corinthians, the writer Paul uh, in the New Testament. Now, you need to know this, and especially if you're new to church, you need to know this. Historically, man-made religion has never been on the side of being faithful in marriage when it comes to sexuality. It has never uh, described uh, mar- uh, marriage between a man and a woman as a place for sex, but ra- rather given all kinds of preferences, whatever you want. It is given, a- in fact, to the point that man-made religion, back when the New Testament was written, when Paul writes this letter, he's writing to a group of people that what their houses of worship had full-time prostitutes in them, and it was a part of worship. You need to know that. Because sometimes we think, oh, religion, this is, Jeff, this is all good for you, you're religious and all that. No, what, I want, what we're talking to you about is about being a follower of Christ. It's about a relationship with God, not about a religion, not about some man-made religion. Jesus came not so you'd have a checklist of stuff or do's or don'ts. He came so you could have a right relationship with God the Father, the one who created you. That's the beauty of Jesus and the cross and his death and his resurrection. So as we're talking through this, you need to know that historically, any, most religions, and it's true of cults today, if you see a cult leader, they're writing their rules around their own pleasures. But when Moses uh, goes up onto the mountain to get with God and he gets the Ten Commandments, the people are waiting. They're saying, what does God want us to do? If Moses were just doing this for himself, if this was his own plan, He would have come down and written something very different. And we know that from all of history, from current cult leaders. They write it around, man, you can just have sex with anybody you want, whenever you want, as many as you want. But Moses comes down and he says, no, God created this to be between a man and a woman in marriage. Jesus confirms that in the New Testament. He talks about it, and Paul writes about that. And so here we are. This is not just some nut who's trying to make us religious. Paul's trying to help us have a relationship with God and understand the creator's purpose and plan. Paul writes to the the people in Corinth. He says, don't you realize? And and they would have said, no, we don't get it. Because our culture says this is all okay. Don't you realize if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her. And they would have said, Paul, what are you talking about? This word joins is such a powerful word. It's the word of oneness. It's, it's like you, you would say it's God's using super glue for you to become one. The, 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 uh, one way I could illustrate this is to say if you've ever scrambled eggs. Once you scramble an egg, you can't unscramble it. It's scrambled. And they would have said, Paul, nobody's joining anybody. Nobody's becoming one. We're just having sex. See, the myth is that sex is just physical. We, that's all it is. We went down to that, that temple, and uh, you know we paid the process, so we, we did our thing. We did the right thing. It's a part of it. It was just sex. We weren't joining. And Paul said, no, you don't understand. This is the part of the talk that most of us don't get. This is the part I wish Dad would have told me. He says, you're joining as one. This is the power of what God has created. This is intimacy. This is what he created for, and there's so much power and beauty in that. He says, don't you realize you become one with her? For the scriptures say, and now he reaches all the way back to when sex is first talked about in the Old Testament uh, to confirm this. And he he says this. Let's read it together. The two are united into one. The two become one flesh. You say, how many people can I become one with? And then I finally meet the person I want to spend my life with, and I think, well, I, I know that that's how I live my life. And some of you right now, that's how you're living your life, and you say, what do I do? You, you need to know that I'm not, I'm not here to judge you. This is just a here. You need to understand what God has for you. And then you get to that place and say, well, I, I know I've lived my life that way, but now it's just for you. What God has won, you can't un And singles, there's a whole lot of you sitting right around married people right now that you've heard their stories. You've heard their regrets. You've heard the pain they're dealing with. And some of you are thinking, yeah, I, that makes sense. That's why they're still dealing with that. And you, you start to connect the dots. 
A lot of you as adults, and maybe you're married and you're going, oh, if I could do it over. And it's not that God's up there saying, oh, I don't want you to have fun. Or be, no, he's saying, I've got, I, I designed this with a plan in mind. And it's so valuable. There's so much benefit if you live within the boundaries I have for you. Now, Paul goes on here and he says, run. Everybody say run. run. What do you do with that? He says, run from sexual sin. If I'm single, I run from sexual sin. Married couples, it, it, if you're single and you think just because you get married, you're not going to have sexual temptation, uh, we live in a world of temptation until the day you die. What are you supposed to do if you're married? You, run. Run from sexual sin. Why? Why run from it? Well, because Paul says this. Here's why you run from it. He says, no other sin so dearly affects the body as this one does. Sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Paul says, the reason you run from this is not because God doesn't want you to have pleasure, not because he doesn't want you to enjoy life. He's got a purpose and plan for you. The reason you run from this is because you're going to hurt yourself when you get outside of God's boundaries. The reason you run from this is you're going to hurt the person that you want to love someday. You're going to hurt them. We ask the questions, and we're like, yeah, I get it. It's not just physical. Guys, you need to know this. Uh, that the, the girl you're dating, the, the person you're living with, you need to know that what she wants from you most is intimacy. It's what she needs from you most. And if you're taking that away from her by, by living outside of God's boundaries, you're hurting her. And you're, you, ladies, you need to know this. If you're giving yourself away to that, man, that's like throwing the Stradivarius. You, you need to see that. And, and right now you may say, ah, it's okay, it's okay. But you've got a lifetime to deal with this. God wants to redeem that part of our lives. Aren't you glad for that? Paul goes on, and I, I, I really w- I want you to understand uh, the next few verses here. He writes to Christians. So if you're here and you're not a Christian, you can take a deep breath and go, oh, thank goodness, I get a break, Okay. Christians, this is for you. He's writing to Christians here, and he says, don't you realize? And they would have said no. The church, the, the, church, the Christians in Corinth would have said, no, we don't get it. He said, don't you realize your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? So when you become a follower of Christ, this is part of the beauty of being a Christian. God fills us with his presence. He gives us power to get through everything we deal with in life instead of just leaning on our own power. He says, don't you realize your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? This is where he dwells, who lives in you and is given to you by God. And he goes on to say, you don't belong to yourself. He started out saying, don't you realize you don't belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. In other words, this is why Jesus came, because we're out here separated from God, and God the Father sent his son. That's the price, so that we could have a right relationship with God. And he says, because of that you're, you're paid for. You're redeemed with this high price. Don't you realize your, your bodies, they don't belong to you anymore. They belong to God. And then he goes on, he finishes, says, he bought you with a high price. Let's, let's read this together. So you must honor God with your body. Listen, Christian, this is what we're to do. Because Jesus paid such a high price. Because God such, paid such a high price. He says, you are to honor God with your body. So when I talk about sexuality, knowing we're all created as sexual beings. No matter where we've been in the past, it's all from this moment forward, I have to say, okay, I need to answer this question. How do I best honor God with my sexuality? That's what I'm supposed to do. How do I do that? And I don't have the power to do that on my own. I need his power. If you're here and you're saying, Jeff, I'm not a Christian yet, I can't do this, I I, I need some help, I agree with you. None of us can do it on our own. We need God's power to honor him with our bodies, our sexuality. How do I do that? I want to give you a couple things real quick before I let you go, just so that you can uh, answer this question. That will help you answer this question better. What do I do? Sex is more than physical. Say it with me again. Sex is more... It's more than physical. I I, I got like five more minutes of you believing that with me before you, okay, right? Okay, you gave me your word, five more minutes. Determine the story you want to tell from this moment on. What will your story be in the future? I don't know the story of your past. I don't need to know the story of your past. But what's your story going to be in the future? Singles, as you're, you're dating, you meet someone in the future, what will your story be for them? 
Is your story going to be, well, yeah, I, you know, I lost my virginity. And you don't really lose virginity. You give it away. Um, I, I've never understood that term. That's a choice. Um, for, unless you've been uh, assaulted, that's a whole different thing. We were talking about that earlier. But when we choose to give that away, you say, well, I did that. And I, I lived in sexual relationship with so many people. Uh, but now my story is going to be I've met you and it's just you. Or, or would you rather have this story in the future? You know, forget the past. I, I just want to tell you this. I went to church one day. Somebody invited me. And there's this guy. You may only remember, uh, you may, you'll never remember my name, but I, I'm, my last name's Love. There's this guy named Dr. Love. <laughs> I mean, how can you forget that with a sex talk, right? There's this guy, and he talked about sex. He talked about me honoring God with my body, and he showed me what God had for me. And you need to know that from that moment on, every date I went on, I dated with that in mind, preparing for you. That's a very different story when you meet that person. If you're a Christian, you're married, and you're living outside of God's guidelines, and you're struggling with sinful issues in this area, what's your story going to be in the future? That you could say, from this day on, everything changed, and I decided to live to honor God. Determine what your story's going to be. God is the God who forgives the sin and guilt and shame of our past. Some of you are going to have to let him do that. You're just letting that dictate your life. Determine your story from this moment on. Second thing, decide your standards ahead of time. What are your standards going to be? Let me tell you, everybody in this room, everybody joining me online, if you're waiting, we know this, if you're waiting to get in the back seat when everything is hot and heavy and you're going to say, well, then I'll decide my standards, I can tell you what your standards will be. It's too late then. You want to honor God with your body, you decide ahead of time. Say, this is God's standards for my life. Sex is more than physical. Decide your standards ahead of time. Listen, every time you say no to temptation, you're making an investment. This is not saying, oh, I can't have any fun. This is making an investment into your future. If you're single, into, into that future that you hope to have someday. Married people, when you say no to temptation, you're investing in the future of your marriage. You need to know that. It's so valuable, and God says this is so powerful for your life. Now, I want you, if you would, to take out your connection cards. If you're new with us, you just need to know. This is something we do every week. We say, okay, how can I apply what we're talking about in my life? It's really simple this week. I ask you to check it off, and the reason I do that is just because I take this one week, and uh, I, your names all get put on a list for me. It lays on my desk, and I pray for you throughout the week. And God would help you to live this out. And I always ask you guys to pray for me. Will you pray for me? Man, because I'm checking this one off this week, and I'm asking you to pray for me. I recognize that sex is more than just physical. Therefore, I will honor God with my sexuality. Determine your story from this moment on. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for our time together. We, we've had some fun with this. At the same time, Lord, I realize that for some people, this subject is very painful because of some past hurts, or maybe because they're the one who's done the hurting in the past. This is a moment, Lord, where we just come to you and we say, Lord, we need your healing. Just make that your prayer. God, I need you to heal me. I need you to heal me, Lord. And I pray over the coming weeks, Lord, that you would just really help us to experience all that you have for us in this area of our life of sexuality. Now, as we're walking through this and we're praying together, if you're here and you're not a follower of Christ, you've never made that decision, that's where this all starts to say, Lord, I want to invite you into my life. Thank you. I see you have a plan for my life. Not only my spiritual life, but my physical, my sexual life, my emotional life. I want to live in the rich, satisfying life you have for me. Forgive me my sin. Remove the guilt and shame of my past. Fill me with your power to live the life you have for me today. I want to receive the promise that you have for me an eternal life right now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.